listening to the audiobook of How the Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World, written by the editorial team of the Epoch Times groundbreaking series, Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party. Chapter 7 Destruction of the Family, Part 1 Preface Since the 1960s, a variety of anti traditional movements, including modern feminism, sexual liberation, and gay rights have risen to prominence in the West. The institution of the family has been hit the hardest. In the United States, the Family Law Reform Act of 1969 gave a green light to unilateral divorce. Other countries soon rolled out similar laws. In the United States, the divorce-to-marriage ratio more than doubled from the 1960s to the 1980s. In the 1950s, about 11% of the children born in a married family saw their parents divorced, and in 1970, the ratio soared to 50%. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, more than 40% of newborn infants in the United States in 2016 were born out of wedlock. In 1956, this figure was less than 5%. In traditional societies in the East and West, Chastity in relations between men and women was seen as a virtue. Today, it's thought to be quaint and even ridiculous. The same-sex marriage movement, accompanied by the feminist movement, has sought to legally redefine the family and marriage. A law professor, who is currently a member of the U.S. Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, initiated a declaration in 2006 called Beyond Same-Sex Marriage, a new strategic vision for all our families and relationships. It advocated that people form any sort of new family according to whatever desires they may have, including polygamous marriages, joint homosexual couple families, and so on. The professor also argued that the traditional marriage and family should not enjoy more legal rights than any other form of family. In public schools, premarital sex and homosexuality, which were regarded as shameful for thousands of years in traditional society, have not only been instilled as normal, but in some schools, they are even explicitly encouraged. In this view, a child's sexual orientation should be freely developed and chosen, with the obvious result of an increase in homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, and so on. For example, in 2012, the Rhode Island School District banned a school's tradition of holding father-daughter dances and mother-son baseball games saying that public schools have no right to instill in children ideas such as that girls like to dance or that boys like baseball. The trend towards gradual destruction of the traditional family is now obvious. The elimination of the family advocated by communism will become a reality before the long-promised elimination of class differences. In Western societies, there are many aspects to the destruction of the family. This includes the impact not only of feminism, sexual liberation, and the homosexual movement, but also the broader social backdrop of left-wing advocacy, progressivism, and the like, all of which are claimed to be under the banners of freedom, fairness, rights, and liberation. These ideas are supported explicitly and implicitly by laws, legal interpretations, and economic policies supported by fellow ideologues. All of it has the effect of inducing people to abandon and transform the concept of the traditional marriage and family. These ideologies originate from the beginning of the 19th century and are deeply infused with communist factors. The evil specter of communism excels at continuous mutation and deception, which has led to constant confusion about what exactly people are supporting when they endorse these policies and ideologies. The result is immersion in a worldview whose parameters were set by communist ideas. The tragic situation today, the degradation of the traditional family and people's confusion about the true nature of this trend, is the result of the meticulous planning and gradual implementation of the spirit of communism over the past 200 years. The consequence is that not only is the family eliminated as a basic unit of social stability, but traditional morality established by God is also destroyed, and the role the family plays in passing on and nurturing the next generation in a framework of traditional beliefs is also lost. 
As a result, the younger generation is unconstrained by traditional ideas and beliefs and become playthings for ideological possession by the communist specter. 1. The Traditional Family Laid Down by God In the traditional cultures of the East and West, marriage was established by gods and is considered to be arranged by heaven. Once formed, the bond of marriage cannot be broken. Both men and women were created by gods according to their own images, and they are all equal before gods. At the same time, gods also made men and women different physically and established respective roles for them. In the Western tradition, women are the bone of men's bones and flesh of their flesh. A man must love his wife as though she were part of his own body, and if necessary, sacrifice himself to protect his wife. In turn, a woman should cooperate with and help her husband, making the couple an integral whole. Men are responsible for working hard and making a living to support the family, while women suffer in childbirth. All this stems from the different original sins people carry. Similarly, in Eastern traditional culture, men are associated with the yang of yin and yang, which is symbolically connected with the sun and the sky, and which thus demands that they continuously strive to make progress and shoulder the responsibility of taking care of the family through hard times. Women belong to the yin principle, symbolically connected to the earth, which means they bear and nurture everything with great virtue. They should be yielding and considerate of others and have the duty to support their husbands and educate their children. Only when men and women work well in their own roles can the yin and the yang be harmonized and children grow and develop in a healthy manner. Traditional families play the role of transmitting beliefs, morality, and maintaining the stability of society. The family is the cradle of belief and the bond for the transmission of values. Parents are the first teacher in children's lives. If children can learn traditional virtues such as selflessness, humility, gratitude, endurance, and more from their parents' words and deeds, they will benefit for the rest of their lives. Traditional married life also helps men and women grow together in morality. It requires husbands and wives to treat their emotions and desires with a new attitude and to be considerate and tolerant of each other. This is fundamentally different from the idea of cohabitation. Human emotions are fickle. If the couple are together because they like to be together and break up because they don't like to anymore, the relationship is not much different from a common friendship unbounded by marriage. Marx ultimately hoped for widespread, unconstrained sexual intercourse, which of course is about dissolving the traditional marriage and thus, in the end, eliminating the institution of the family. 2. Communism's Aim to Eliminate the Family Communism believes that the family is a form of private ownership. To eliminate private ownership, therefore, it follows that the family should also be eliminated. The original principle of communism regards economic factors to be key in determining the kind of family relationships formed. Contemporary Marxian Freudianism regards sexual desire as the key to questions associated with the family. The common characteristic of these two ideologies is their casting aside of basic human morality, their worship of materialism, desire, and pragmatic interests. All of this simply turns humans into beasts. It is a twisted ideology that has the effect of destroying the family by corrupting thought. The fantastic delusion that sits at the heart of communism is the doctrine of the liberation of mankind. This manifests not merely as supposed liberation in an economic sense, but also the liberation of mankind itself. The opposite of liberation, of course, is oppression. So where does the oppression that must be resisted come from? Communism's answer is that the oppression comes from people's own notions, which are imposed by traditional social morality. The patriarchy of the traditional family structure oppresses women, traditional sexual morality oppressed human nature, and so on. The feminism and homosexual rights movements of later generations inherited and then expanded upon this communist-inspired theory of liberation. It leads to a full battery of concepts in opposition to traditional marriage and family, 
as well as sexual liberation, homosexuality, and the like. All of these ideas have become tools used by the devil to undermine and destroy the family. Communism sets itself against and wishes to overthrow all traditional moral values, as clearly stated in the Communist Manifesto. 3. Communism's Promotion of Promiscuity The communist evil specter sets itself against the traditional family, which it wants to destroy. Early in the 19th century, Robert Owen, a representative of utopian socialism, sowed the seeds of the devil's ideology. A communist ideological pioneer, Owen established the utopian community New Harmony in Indiana in 1824. It failed two years later. On the day the community was established, he declared, quote, I now declare to you and to the world that man, up to this hour, has been, in all parts of the earth, a slave to a trinity of the most monstrous evils that could be combined to inflict mental and physical evil upon his whole race. I refer to private or individual property, absurd and irrational systems of religion, and marriage, founded on individual property combined with some one of these irrational systems of religion. After Owen died, another influential utopian communist was the Frenchman Charles Fourier, whose thoughts deeply influenced Marx and Marxists. After his death, his disciples brought his thoughts into the Revolution of 1848 and the Paris Commune, and later spread them to the United States. Fourier first coined the term feminist, feminisme in French. In his ideal communist society, called the Phalanx, the traditional family was scorned, and bacchanals and orgies were praised as fully liberating human inner passions. He also declared that a fair society should take care of those who are sexually rejected, such as the elderly, or unattractive, to ensure that everyone has the right to sexual gratification. He believes that any form of sexual gratification, including sadomasochism, where one person inflicts pain on the other person, and even incest and bestiality, should be allowed as long as it's consensual. Fourier, therefore, can be regarded as the pioneer of queer theory, a branch of the contemporary homosexual movement, including LGBTQ and the like. Because of the influence of Owen, and especially of Fourier, dozens of communist utopian communes were set up in the United States in the 19th century, though most were short-lived and ended in failure. The longest was the Oneida Commune, established on the basis of Fourier's theory, which lasted 32 years. The commune despised traditional monogamous marriages and advocated polygamy and group sex. Members got a, quote, fair sexual access by being allotted the opportunity each week to have sex with anyone of their choosing. In the end, the founder, John Humphrey Noyes, fled for fear of a lawsuit by the church. The commune was forced to abandon wife-sharing, though Noyes later wrote books and became the originator of Bible communism. Communism's promiscuous gene is an inevitable consequence of its theoretical development. From the very beginning, the demon of communism tempted people to abandon godly teachings, to deny the divine, and to deny original sin. According to this logic, social problems originally caused by the degeneration of human morality were attributed to private ownership. Communism leads people to believe that if private property is destroyed, people will not fight over it. However, even if all property is shared, people might also have conflicts over their spouses. Therefore, utopian socialists openly use a system of wife-sharing to solve such problems inherent in human nature. These communist, quote, paradises either directly challenged the traditional family or advocated a system of common wives, which led local communities, churches, and governments to see them as a challenge to traditional morality and ethics, and take action to suppress them. The scandalous communist sharing of wealth and wives became widely known. The failure of utopian communes taught Marx and Engels a lesson. It was not yet the time to openly advocate promiscuous wife-sharing. Although the goal of eliminating the family in the Communist Manifesto had not changed, they adopted a more concealed approach to putting forward their theories and destroying families. After the death of Marx, Engels published the book The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State 
in the light of the researches of Lewis H. Morgan. To complete Marx's theory on the family and further expound the Marxian view of marriage, quote, the emergence of monogamy is based on the supremacy of the man, the express purpose being to produce children of undisputed paternity. Such paternity is demanded because these children are later to come into their father's property as his natural heirs. It is distinguished from pairing marriage by the much greater strength of the marriage tie, which can no longer be dissolved at either partner's wish. Engels argued that monogamy was based around private property, and that once all property is shared, there would be a brand new model of marriage based purely on love. Superficially, it sounds so noble, but it is not. The attempted defenses of Marx and Engels seem feeble in light of the actual implementation of communist theory. Feelings are unreliable. If a person loves someone today and another person tomorrow, does that not encourage promiscuity? The promiscuity that took place after the establishment of the former Soviet Union and the Chinese communist regime, which will be discussed in the following section, is in fact the result of applied Marxist doctrine. Relationships between husbands and wives aren't always smooth sailing. The vow, till death do us part, during a traditional wedding, is a vow to God. It also represents the idea that both parties are prepared to face and overcome all hardships together. What maintains a marriage is not merely emotion or feelings, but also a sense of responsibility. Treating one's other half, the children, and the family with care transforms both the husband and wife into a mature man and woman with a sense of moral responsibility. Marx and Engels boasted in The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State that in a communist society, private property becomes public, housework becomes professionalized. There's no need to worry about looking after children since it's the country's responsibility to take care of and educate the children. They wrote, quote, This removes all the anxiety about the consequences, which today is the most essential social, moral, as well as economic, factor that prevents a girl from giving herself completely to the man she loves. Will not that suffice to bring about the gradual growth of unconstrained sexual intercourse and with it a more tolerant public opinion in regard to a maiden's honor and a woman's shame? What Marx and Engels promoted, even though using the phrases freedom, liberation, and love to conceal the fact, was nothing more than the complete abandonment of personal moral responsibility. They encouraged people to act solely on their desires. However, during Marx's era, and that of Fourier, most people had not abandoned godly teachings entirely and were wary of communism's promotion of promiscuity. Yet even Marx himself could hardly have imagined the rationalizations that people would come up with in the 20th century and following to embrace the sexual chaos of Marx's thought and press forward the goal of eliminating the family. The Red Demon arranged certain individuals to sow the seeds of paying too much attention to sex and deviance. It also systematically arranged for luring people to follow their desires and oppose godly teachings so as to gradually deprave them until finally achieving the goal of eliminating the family. This ultimately brings about the deviation of the human heart and leads people to fall into the devil's grasp. 4. The Practice of Wife-Sharing Under Communism the sexual chaos described above is an innate part of communism. Marx is believed to have raped his maid and had Engels raise the child. Engels cohabitated with two sisters. Lenin carried out an extramarital affair with a woman named Inesa for ten years and also committed adultery with a French woman. He also contracted syphilis, consorting with prostitutes. Stalin was equally lustful and is known to have taken advantage of other people's wives. After the Soviets seized power, they instituted the practice of wife-sharing. The Soviet Union at the time can be viewed as the pioneer of sexual liberation in the West. In the 10th edition of the Russian magazine Rodina, printed in 1990, the phenomenon of wife-sharing during early Soviet rule was exposed. The piece also described the private lives of Soviet leaders Trotsky, Bukharin, Antonov, Kolontai, and others saying that they were as casual as dogs in their sexual activities. A. 
Wife-sharing in the Soviet Union As early as 1904, Lenin wrote, quote, Lust can emancipate the energy of the spirit, not for pseudo-family values, but for the victory of socialism must this blood clot be done away with. At a meeting of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, Leon Trotsky proposed that once the Bolsheviks seize power, new fundamental principles of sexual relations would be drafted. Communist theory demands the destruction of the family and the transition to a period of unconstrained satisfaction of sexual desire. Trotsky also said that the responsibility to educate children resides solely with the state. In a letter to Lenin in 1911, Trotsky wrote, quote, Undoubtedly, sexual oppression is the main means of enslaving a person. While such oppression exists, there can be no question of real freedom. The family, like a bourgeois institution, has completely outlived itself. It is necessary to speak more about this to the workers. Lenin replied, quote, And not only the family. All prohibitions relating to sexuality must be abolished. We have something to learn from the suffragettes. Even the ban on same-sex love should be lifted. After the Bolsheviks seized power, Lenin brought out a series of regulations effectively abolishing marriage and the punishment of homosexuality. At that time, there was also the slogan, quote, down with shame. This was part of the Bolshevik attempt to create the, quote, new man of socialist ideology, and sometimes even included roaming the streets naked and hysterically screaming slogans like, quote, shame is in the bourgeois past of the Soviet people. On December 19, 1918, to celebrate the commemoration day of the decree effectively abolishing marriage, lesbian groups celebrated. Trotsky writes in his memoirs that the news of lesbians celebrating with a parade made Lenin very happy. Lenin also encouraged more people to march naked. In 1923, the Soviet novel, The Loves of Three Generations, popularized the word glass of waterism. The author, People's Commissar for Social Welfare Alexandra Kolontai, was a revolutionary who fought her way into the Bolshevik faction from a traditional family in search of women's liberation. The glass of waterism promoted by the novel is, in fact, a synonym for sexual indulgence. In communist society, satisfying sexual desire is as normal and easy as drinking a glass of water. Glass of waterism was widespread among factory workers and especially teenage students. The well-known communist Smidovich wrote in the Pravda newspaper, March 21, 1925, quote, The current morality of our youth is summarized as follows. Every member, even a minor, of the Communist Youth League and every student of the RABFAC, Communist Party Training School, has the right to satisfy his sexual desire. This concept has become an axiom, and abstinence is considered a notion of bourgeois. If a man lusts after a young girl, whether she is a student, a worker, or even a school-age girl, then the girl must obey his lust, otherwise it will be considered a bourgeois daughter, unworthy to be called a true communist. Divorce also became normalized and widespread. Paul Kengor noted in his book, Takedown, From Communists to Progressives, how the left has sabotaged family and marriage. Quote, The divorce rate skyrocketed to levels unseen in human history. In short order, it seemed as though everyone in Moscow had a divorce. In 1926, the influential American magazine, The Atlantic, published an article about the astonishing situation in the USSR with the title, quote, The Russian Effort to Abolish Marriage. The phenomenon of Swedish families, which has nothing to do with Sweden, but refers to a large group of men and women living together and engaging in casual sex, also appeared during this period of sexual liberation. This opened the doors to promiscuity, sexual chaos, homosexuality, moral collapse, the destruction of families, sexually transmitted diseases, rape, and more. Following the expansion of socialist communes, these Swedish families spread across the Soviet Union. This was known as the nationalization or socialization of women. The socialist women in Yekaterinburg, March 1918, are a sad example. After the Bolsheviks seized the city, they issued an ordinance that young women between ages of 16 to 25 must be, quote, socialized. 
The order was implemented by several party officials, and ten young women were socialized. The Bolsheviks quickly tightened their policies on sex at the end of the 1920s. During a conversation with feminist activist Clara Zetkin, Lenin deplored the glass of waterism philosophy, calling it anti Marxist and anti social. The reason was because sexual liberation brought about an undesirable byproduct many newborn babies. Many were abandoned. Again, it was shown that the destruction of the family eventually results in societal collapse. B. Sexual Liberation in Yan'an During the CCP's early years, the circumstances were similar to that of the Soviet Union. Of course, these communist parties are all varieties of poisonous fruits from the same tree. Chen Dushu, an early communist leader, was known for his debauched personal life. According to the memoirs of Zheng Shaolin and Chen Bilian, Zhu Chuebai, Sai He Sen, Zhang Taile, Xiang Jinyu, Pang Shouju, and others, they had a somewhat confused sexual history, and their attitude toward sex was similar to the glass of waterism of the early Soviet revolutionaries. Sexual liberation was embraced not only by the party's intellectual leaders, but also by ordinary people living in the CCP's early, quote, Soviets, revolutionary enclaves set up before the National Party was overthrown, in Hebei, Henan, and Anhui, due to the promotion of equality of women and absolute freedom of marriage and divorce, revolutionary work was often disrupted in order to satisfy sexual desire. Young people in the Soviet areas sometimes engaged in romantic affairs in the name of connecting with the masses. It wasn't unusual for young women to have six or seven sexual partners. According to the collection of revolutionary historical documents in the Hebei, Henan, Anhui Soviet districts, among local party chiefs in places like Hong'an, Huangma, Huangqi, Guangshan, and elsewhere, quote, about three-quarters of them kept sexual relations with dozens or hundreds of women. In late spring of 1931, when Zhang Guotao took charge of the Hebei, Henan, Anhui Soviet districts, he noted that syphilis was so widespread that he had to report to the party central for doctors who specialize in treating the disease. Many years later, in his memoirs, he still vividly recalled stories of women in the Soviet districts being sexually harassed, including some of the senior general's mistresses. In 1937, Li Kernong was serving as the director of the CCP's 8th Route Army Office in Nanjing, making him responsible for collecting military stipends, medicine, and supplies. On one occasion, when checking the medicine list of the 8th Route Army, the national government staff found a large quantity of drugs for treating sexually transmitted disease. The staff asked Li Kernong, Are there a lot of people in your army suffering from this disease? Lee wasn't sure what to say, so he lied and said it was to treat the local people. By the 1930s, however, sexual freedom came to be perceived as a threat to the regime. The same problem of social disintegration, found in Soviet Russia, was apparent, and Red Army conscripts began worrying that their wives would take up extramarital affairs or divorce them once they joined the revolution. This affected the combat effectiveness of the troops. Moreover, the trend of promiscuity seemed to reinforce the notoriety of the, quote, common property, common wives slogan. Thus, Soviet districts began implementing policies protecting military marriages, limiting the number of divorces, and more. 5. How Communism Destroys Families in the West The evil spirit's ideological trends find their origins in the 19th century. After a century of transformation and evolution in the West, they finally came to the fore in the United States in the 1960s. In the 1960s, influenced and encouraged by neo-Marxism and various other radical ideologies, social and cultural movements manipulated by the evil spirit appeared. These include the hippie counterculture, the radical new left, the feminist movement, and the sexual revolution. The turbulence of these social movements was a fierce attack against America's political system, traditional value system, and social fabric. The movements quickly spread through Europe, rapidly altering the way mainstream thought about society, the family, sex, and cultural values. 
While this was going on, the gay rights movement was also rising. The convergence of these forces led to the weakening of traditional Western family values and the decline of the institution of the traditional family and its centrality in social life. At the same time, social turmoil triggered a series of problems, including the proliferation of pornography, the spread of drug abuse, the collapse of sexual morality, the rise of juvenile crime rate, and the expansion of groups depending on social welfare. A. Promoting Sexual Liberation Sexual liberation, also known as the sexual revolution, originated in the United States in the 1960s. Its subsequent rapid spread through the world dealt a devastating blow to traditional moral values, in particular, traditional family values and sexual morality. The evil spirit made ample preparations for using sexual liberation against Western societies. The free love movement paved the way to gradually erode and disintegrate traditional family values. The concept of free love violates traditional sexual morality and argues that sexual activity of all forms should be free from social regulation. In this view, individual sexual activities, including marriage, abortion, and adultery, should not be restricted by the government or law, nor subject to social sanction. The followers of Charles Fourier and the Christian socialist John Humphrey Noyes were the first to coin the term free love. In recent times, the main promoters of free love ideas are almost all socialists or people deeply influenced by socialist thought. For example, among those pioneering the free love movement in Britain was socialist philosopher Edward Carpenter, who was also an early activist for gay rights. The gay rights movement's most famous advocate, British philosopher Bertrand Russell, was an avowed socialist and a member of the Fabian Society. He claimed that morality should not limit humanity's instinctive drive toward pleasure and advocated premarital and extramarital sex. The main forerunner of the free love movement in France was Émile Armand. In his early days, he was an anarcho-communist who later built on Fourier's utopian communism, founded French individualist anarchism, which falls under the broader category of socialism, and advocated promiscuity, homosexuality, and bisexuality. The pioneer of the free love movement in Australia was Chummy Fleming, an anarchist, another socialist offshoot. The free love movement in America bore important fruit, Playboy, the erotic magazine founded in 1953. The magazine made use of coded paper to create the impression that it was artistic and not seedy. It also used expensive color printing, with the result that pornographic content typically regarded as low-class and vulgar swiftly entered the mainstream, and Playboy became a high-class leisure magazine. For more than half a century, it has spread the toxin of sexual freedom to people around the world and has laid siege to traditional morals and perceptions regarding sex. In the middle of the 20th century, with hippie culture increasing in popularity and free love gaining widespread acceptance, the sexual revolution, also known as sexual liberation, made its official debut. The term sexual revolution was coined by Wilhelm Reich, the founder of communist psychoanalysis and a German communist. He combined Marxism with Freudian psychoanalysis and believed that the former liberated people from economic oppression while the latter liberated people from sexual repression. Another founder of sexual liberation theory was Herbert Marcuse of the Frankfurt School. During the Western counterculture movement of the 1960s, his slogan, Make Love, Not War, embedded the notion of sexual liberation deep within people's hearts. Since then, with the publication of Alfred Kinsey's Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, and the widespread use of oral contraceptives, the notion of sexual liberation swept through the West. It is worth mentioning that contemporary scholars have discovered distorted statistical data in Kinsey's work, as well as exaggeration, oversimplification, and other fallacies driven by his political and ideological commitments. Kinsey set out to show that extramarital sex, homosexual sex, and so on were common, and thus to direct society to accept the normalization of these phenomena, a task at which he was largely successful. All at once, being sexually liberated became fashionable. Among young people, promiscuity came to be considered normal. 
Teens who admitted to being virgins were ridiculed by their peers. Data show that of those who turned 15 years of age between 1954 to 1963, the 60s generation, 82% had premarital sex before the age of 30. In the 2010s, new brides who were still virgins before they married numbered only 5%, while 18% of brides had previously had 10 or more sexual partners before marriage. The cultural mainstream has become saturated with sex, including in literature, film, advertising, and television. B. Promoting feminism and spurning the traditional family. The communist ideology behind the feminist movement. The feminist movement is another tool the communist specter has used to destroy the family. When it began in the 18th century, the feminist movement, also known as first wave feminism, started in Europe and advocated that women should be accorded the same treatment as men in education, employment, and politics. The center of the feminist movement shifted from Europe to the United States in the mid-19th century. When first-wave feminism started, the notion of the traditional family still had a strong foundation in society, and the feminist movement did not advocate directly challenging the traditional family. The influential feminists at that time, such as Mary Wollstonecraft of 18th century England, Margaret Fuller of 19th century America, and John Stuart Mill of 19th century England, all advocated that, in general, women should prioritize the family after marriage, that the potential of women should be developed within the domain of the family, and that women should enrich themselves for the sake of the family, such as educating the children, managing the family, and so on. They thought, however, that some special women who are particularly talented should not be constrained by society and should be free to utilize their talents even to the extent of competing with men. After the 1920s, when the right for women to vote was written into law in many countries, the first wave of women's rights movements gradually receded. In the following years, with the impact of the Great Depression and World War II, the feminist movement essentially laid down its flag. At the same time, the communist specter began to sow the seeds of destruction for traditional marriage and sexual ethics. The early utopian socialists of the 19th century laid the direction for modern radical feminist movements. François-Marie Charles Foyer, called the father of feminism, declared that marriage turns women into private property. Robert Owen cursed marriage as evil. The ideas of these utopian socialists were inherited and developed by later feminists, including, for example, Francis Wright, who in the 19th century inherited the ideas of Foyer and advocated sexual freedom for women. The British feminist activist Anna Wheeler inherited Owen's ideas, fiercely condemning marriage for supposedly turning women into slaves. Socialist feminist activists were also an important part of the feminist movement in the 19th century. At that time, among the most influential feminist publications in France were La Voix des Femmes, the very first feminist publication in France, and Free Women, La Femme Libre, later renamed La Tribune des Femmes, as well as La Politique des Femmes, among others. The founders of these publications were either followers of Foyer or of Henri de Saint-Simon, the advocate of modernity. Because of the close connection between feminism and socialism, the authorities scrutinized feminism. When the first wave of women's rights movements proceeded in full swing, the devil of communism also made arrangements to introduce a variety of radical thoughts to attack traditional concepts of family and marriage, paving the way for the more radical feminist movement that followed. The second wave of feminist movements began in the United States in the late 1960s, then spread to Western and Northern Europe, and quickly expanded to the entire Western world. American society in the late 1960s went through a period of turmoil with the civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, and various radical social trends. Feminism, taking advantage of this unique set of circumstances, emerged in a more radical strain and became popular. The cornerstone of this wave of feminist movements was the book The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan published in 1963, as well as the National Organization for Women, 
now, which she founded. Using the perspective of a suburban middle-class housewife, Frieden fiercely criticized the traditional family role of women and argued that the traditional image of a happy, content, joyful housewife is a myth forged by a patriarchal society. She argued that middle-class suburban families are, quote, a comfortable concentration camp for American women, and that modern educated women should reject the sense of accomplishment attained through supporting their husbands and educating their children, but instead realize their worth outside the family. A few years later, more radical feminists dominated the National Women's Organization, inheriting and developing Frieden's ideas. They said that women had been oppressed by patriarchy since ancient times and attributed the root cause of women's oppression to the family. In response, they came to advocate the complete transformation of the social system and traditional culture and struggle in all aspects of human affairs, the economy, education, culture, and the family to achieve female equality. Classifying a society into the oppressor and the oppressed to advocate for a struggle, liberation, and equality is exactly what communism is all about. Traditional Marxism classifies groups according to their economic statuses, while neo-feminist movements divide people based on gender. Betty Frieden, the author of The Feminine Mystique, was not, as her book described, a middle-class suburban housewife bored with her housework. Daniel Horowitz, a professor at Smith College, wrote a biography of Frieden in 1998 titled Betty Frieden and the Making of the Feminine Mystique. His research revealed that Frieden, under her maiden name Betty Goldstein, had been a radical socialist activist since her college years up to the 1950s. At different times, she was a professional journalist, or propagandist to be accurate, for several radical labor unions in the orbit of the Communist Party USA. David Horowitz, a former leftist and no relation to Daniel Horowitz, reviewed her published articles to understand the development of her views. She was a member of the Young Communist League while in UC Berkeley. Frieden even requested twice, at different times, to join the CPUSA. Judith Hennessy, her authorized biographer, also indicates she was a Marxist. Kate Wiegand, an American scholar, points out in her book Red Feminism that feminism, in fact, did not stay quiet in the United States from the early 20th century to the 1960s. During that period, a large group of red feminist writers with communist backgrounds paved the way for the subsequent second-wave feminist movement. These include Susan Anthony, Eleanor Flex, Gerda Lerner, Eve Miriam, and the like. As early as 1946, Anthony applied the Marxist analytical method to draw an analogy between the white oppressing the black and the male oppressing the female. However, due to the McCarthyism of the period, such writers no longer talked about their red background. In Europe, French writer Simone de Beauvoir's iconic work, The Second Sex, ushered in the craze for the second wave of feminism. De Beauvoir used to be a socialist. In 1941, together with communist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre and other writers, she created Socialiste et Liberté, a French underground socialist organization. With the rise of her reputation for feminism in the 1960s, de Beauvoir declared that she no longer believed in socialism and claimed that she was only a feminist. She said, quote, One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. She advocated that though sex is determined by physiological characteristics, gender is a self perceived psychological concept formed under the influence of human sociality. She argued that the temperaments of obedience, submissiveness, affection, and maternity are all derived from the myth carefully designed by the patriarchy for its oppression of women, and advocated that women break through traditional notions and realize their unrestrained selves. This mentality, in fact, lies at the heart of the damaging notions of homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, and the like. Since then, various feminist thoughts have emerged in a constant stream, all looking at the world through the lens of women being oppressed by a patriarchy, 
which is realized through the institution of the traditional family, making the family, then, an obstacle to the realization of female equality. De Beauvoir held that women are restrained by their husbands due to marriage, and called marriage as disgusting as prostitution. She refused to get married and maintained an open relationship with Sartre. By the same token, Sartre also engaged in sexual encounters with other women. Her view on marriage is the standard among contemporary radical feminists. Such chaotic sexual liaisons and relationships are precisely the system of... You're listening to the audiobook of How the Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World. Written by the editorial team of the Epoch Times groundbreaking series, Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party. Chapter 7. Destruction of the Family, Part 2. 5. How Communism Destroys Families in the West, Continued. B. Promoting Feminism and Spurning the Traditional Family, Continued. Results of the Feminist Movement, Broken Families, Degenerate Relationships, Confused Sex Roles Feminism is now prevalent in all sections of society. According to a public survey conducted by Harvard in 2016, about 59% of women expressed support for feminist views. One major assertion of contemporary feminism is that apart from the physiological differences in male and female reproductive organs, all other physical and psychological differences between men and women, including divergences in behavior and personality, are social and cultural constructs. By this logic, men and women should be completely equal in all aspects of life and society, and all manifestations of inequality between men and women are the result of a culture and society that is oppressive and sexist. For example, the number of men working as executives in large companies high-level academics in elite universities, and senior government officials far outstrips the proportion of women in similar positions. Many feminists believe this is mainly caused by sexism, when in fact, a fair comparison between the sexes can be made only when considering factors such as ability, hours, work ethic, and the like. Success in high-level positions often requires long-term, high-intensity overtime work the sacrifice of weekends and evenings, sudden emergency meetings, frequent business travel, and so on. Giving birth tends to interrupt a woman's career, and women are inclined to reserve time to spend with their families and children instead of dedicating themselves completely to their work. In addition, people with the aptitude to fill high-level positions tend to possess strong personalities, whereas women tend to be gentler and more agreeable. These are the main reasons why females fill such a small proportion of high-level positions. However, feminists regard women's tendencies to be gentle and to orient themselves around family and children as traits imposed upon them by a sexist society. According to feminism, these differences should be corrected by services such as public daycare and other forms of welfare. Contemporary Feminism cannot tolerate any explanation of inequality between men and women that bases its argument on natural physiological and psychological differences between men and women. All blame must be laid at the feet of social conditioning and traditional morality. In 2005, Lawrence Summers, president of Harvard University, spoke at an academic conference to discuss why women are less likely than men to teach in the scientific and mathematics fields of top universities. In addition to the 80-some hours per week required for these positions and their unpredictable work schedules, time most women would reserve for family, Summers proposed that men and women may simply differ in their competence when it comes to advanced science and math. Despite supporting his statements with relevant studies, Summer became the target of protests by the feminist organization NOW. The group accused him of sexism and demanded his removal. Summers was roundly criticized in the media and forced to make a public apology for his statements. He then dedicated $50 million to increase the diversity of the Harvard faculty. In 1980, Science Magazine published a study showing that male and female middle school students had significant differences in their mathematical reasoning ability, with boys performing better than girls. 
a subsequent study that compared SAT math test scores for males and females, found male examinees were four times as likely to achieve a score of more than 600 as compared with females. This gap became even more extreme at the 700-point threshold, where 13 times more male test takers reached this score than did females. The same research team did another study in the year 2000, finding that both male and female SAT examinees who demonstrated mathematical genius on their SAT scores tended to obtain advanced degrees in science and math-related fields and were satisfied with their achievements. Lawrence Summers' arguments were backed up by scientific data. Some reports noted that Summers' treatment following the 2005 conference mirrors the re-education policies used by communist regimes to suppress dissidents, even as the causes of inequality had yet to be determined. Equality of outcome was enforced by encouraging diversity, that is, ensuring a larger number of female instructors in the math and scientific fields. It is simple to see the links between feminism and socialism. The 19th century French diplomat and political scientist Alex de Tocqueville said, Democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. But notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality in liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. None of this is meant to prove that men are superior to women in intelligence or ability, as men's and women's talents manifest themselves in different competencies. Deliberate attempts to eliminate differences between the sexes run counter to common sense and prevent both men and women from fulfilling their potential. While the reasons for psychological and intellectual disparities between men and women may not be immediately obvious, denying their physical and reproductive differences flies in the face of fact. In the traditional view of both the East and the West, men are protective figures. It's normal that firefighters are overwhelmingly male. However, feminists, believing in absolute equality between men and women, demand that women take on traditionally male duties and ignore the consequences of the widely differing results. In 2005, the New York Fire Department allowed a woman to become a firefighter without passing the physical trials, which typically include completing tasks while wearing oxygen tanks and other equipment weighing 50 pounds. Other firefighters expressed concerns about this, saying that colleagues who couldn't meet the standards would inevitably create burdens and danger for the rest of the team and for the public. The fire department eventually hired the woman so as to avoid a lawsuit. Feminist groups had long blamed the New York Fire Department's high physical standards for the low proportion of women entering the firefighting force. The Chicago Fire Department faced similar challenges and was forced to lower the standard in order to increase the number of female firefighters. In Australia, many city fire departments have implemented gender quotas. For each male applicant hired, a woman has to be hired as well. In order to meet this requirement, vastly different physical standards have been set for men and women, despite their applying for the same dangerous, high-stress job. This illogical campaign for equality of outcome didn't stop there. The quotas created friction between male and female firefighters, who reported that their male co-workers blamed them for being unqualified and incompetent. Feminist groups latched onto this as bullying and psychological pressure. The situation created yet another battle for feminists to fight in their apparent crusade for equality. But this absurdity is a deliberate step in the plans of the communist specter. By challenging the supposed patriarchy, that is, traditional society, feminism undermines the traditional family, the same way that class struggle is used to undermine the capitalist system. In a traditional culture, it is taken for granted that men should be masculine and women should be feminine. Men shoulder responsibility for their families and communities by protecting women and children. The very patriarchal structure that feminism challenges on the grounds that it confers unfair advantages to men while restraining women. Feminism has no place for the traditional spirit of chivalry or gentlemanly behavior. In a feminist world, the men aboard the sinking Titanic 
would not have sacrificed their places in the lifeboats so that the female passengers could have a better chance at survival. Feminism's crusade against patriarchy has also entered the realm of education. In 1975, a Pennsylvania court ruling on a lawsuit against the Pennsylvania Intercollegiate Athletic Federation ordered that schools must include both male and female students in all physical activities, including wrestling and American football. Girls were not allowed to abstain on the basis of their gender alone. In her 2013 book, The War Against Boys, How Feminism is Harming Our Young Men, American scholar Christina Hoff Summers argued that masculinity is coming under attack. She showcased the example of Aviation High School in Queens, New York, which primarily accepts students from low-income families. The school raised these children to high standards of academic achievement and was ranked as one of the best high schools in America by U.S. News and World Report. The school specializes in teaching its students via hands-on projects, such as constructing electrical mechanical aircraft, and unsurprisingly, the class body is overwhelmingly male. Girls, while forming a smaller percentage of students, also perform remarkably and earn the respect of their peers and instructors. Nevertheless, Aviation High School faced increasing criticism and threats of lawsuits from feminist organizations demanding that more female students be admitted. Speaking at the White House in 2010, the founder of the National Women's Law Center took specific aim at Aviation High School as a case of gender isolation and said, We are hardly going to rest on our laurels until we have absolute equality and we are not there yet. For feminists, raising boys to pursue masculine traits of independence and adventure and encouraging girls to be gentle, considerate, and family-oriented amounts to nothing more than oppression and sexist inequality. Modern feminism is forcing society into a gender-free future by attacking the psychological characteristics of men and women that characterize their respective sex. This has particularly severe implications for children and young people who are in their formative years and among whom increasing numbers are expected to become homosexual, bisexual, or transgender. This is already underway in some European countries, where more and more children report feeling that they were born in the wrong body. In 2009, the Gender Identity Development Service, GIDS, based at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust in London, received 97 referrals for sex transitioning. By 2017, GIDS was receiving over 2,500 such referrals annually. Traditional society regards childbirth and the education of children to be the sacred duty of women, ordained by God or heaven. In the annals of both East and West, behind every great hero is a great mother. Feminism discards this tradition as patriarchal oppression and holds that expecting women to be responsible for raising their children is a key example of this oppression. Contemporary feminist literature is full of criticisms of motherhood and married life as being monotonous, boring, and unfulfilling. The bias of this dim view is apparent when considering the personal lives of well-known feminists. Nearly all of them suffer from broken relationships or failed marriages, or they are childless. Feminism has opened the door to all kinds of ridiculous notions. There are those who insist that the personal is political and see domestic conflicts as gender wars. Some consider men parasites who enslave women's minds and bodies. Others describe children as a hindrance to women looking to reach their full potential and claim that the roots of oppression are in the family structure. Modern feminism openly proclaims that its aim is to destroy the traditional family. Typical statements include the following. Quote, the precondition for women's liberation is an end to the marriage system. Quote, the choice to serve and be protected and plan towards being a family maker is a choice that shouldn't be. Quote, we can't destroy the inequities between men and women until we destroy marriage. Feminist movements resolved supposed social problems by promoting moral degeneracy and destroying human relations in the name of liberation. According to Sylvia Ann Hewlett, 
an American economist and gender specialist, modern feminism is the major contributing factor to a large number of single mother households, while no fault divorce actually provides a convenient means for men to abandon their responsibilities. Ironically, feminism's assault on the existing family structure works to destroy the haven that ensures the happiness and security of most women. Easy divorce did not emancipate women. Studies found that 27% of divorced women were living below the poverty line, a percentage three times higher than that of divorced men. The specter of communism cares nothing about women's rights. Feminism is merely its tool to destroy families and corrupt humankind. C. Perverting the family structure through homosexuality The lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender LGBT movement has been closely associated with communism ever since the first utopians began touting homosexuality as a human right. Since the communist movement claims to emancipate people from the bondage of traditional morality, its ideology naturally calls for supposed LGBT rights as a part of its program of sexual liberation. Many proponents of sexual liberation, who staunchly support homosexuality, are communists or share their views. The world's first major LGBT movement was started by senior figures of Germany's Social Democratic Party, SPD, during the 1890s. Led by Magnus Hirschfeld, this group promoted homosexuality as being natural and moral. In 1897, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, known in German as the Wissenschaftlich Humanitaris Komitee, WHK, was founded by Hirschfeld to advocate for LGBT causes and began their first public campaign that year. In 1895, when British writer Oscar Wilde was investigated for his sexual relationship with another man, the SPD was the only group that stood up in his defense. SPD leader Edward Bernstein proposed a bill to overturn the law banning sodomy. One of the most radical examples of sexual liberation in the era came following the Bolsheviks' October Revolution in Russia. Soviet sexual policies, which were discussed earlier in this chapter, abolished legal prohibition on homosexual relationships, making the Soviet Union the most liberal country on earth by leftist standards. In 1997, the African National Congress, ANC, of South Africa passed the world's first constitution that recognized homosexuality as a human right. The ANC, a member of the Socialist International, formerly a branch of the now defunct Second International, has consistently supported homosexuality. Inspired by Hirschfeld's WHK, in 1924, Henry Gerber founded the Society for Human Rights, SHR, the first American LGBT rights organization. SHR was short lived, as several of its members were arrested soon after its establishment. In 1950, American communist Harry Hay founded the Mattachine Society in his Los Angeles residency. The organization was the first influential LGBT group in the United States. It expanded to other areas and released its own publications. In 1957, zoologist Evelyn Hooker claimed in her research that there was no mental difference between homosexual and heterosexual men. Her work then became the main scientific basis used to justify homosexuality. Hooker had links to a member of the Mattachine Society who persuaded her to support homosexuality. Her study has been criticized for picking all its subjects from the ranks of the Mattachine Society. In the 1960s, accompanying the wave of sexual liberalization and the hippie movement, the homosexual cause went public. In 1971, the National Organization for Women, now a major American feminist organization, stated its support for homosexual rights. In 1974, the American Psychiatric Association, APA, cited Evelyn Hooker's research as the main evidence for taking homosexuality off the list of mental disorders. But in the actual vote, this decision was opposed by 39% of the APA's members. In other words, the research was far from unanimously convincing. 
Hooker and her follow-up researchers chose the so-called adjustment test results as a measure for the psychological status of homosexuals. To put it plainly, if a person can adapt to society, maintain self-esteem and good interpersonal relationships, and has no psychological barriers in his or her regular social life, he or she can be considered a psychologically normal person. In 2015, Dr. Robert L. Kinney III published an article in the medical journal Lincor that discussed the flaws in the standard hooker used to determine the presence or lack of mental disorder. As an example, there is a type of mental illness called xenomelia, which creates in its sufferers a strong desire to cut off their own healthy, functioning limbs. Similar to how some homosexuals are convinced they were born with the wrong sex organs, Xenomelia patients strongly believe that one or more of their body parts do not belong to them. This kind of patient is fully capable of adapting to society, maintaining self-esteem and good interpersonal relationships, and has no psychological barriers to function in society. Patients experience satisfaction when the offending limb is amputated and report that it improves their lives. Kinney's report cited other mental illnesses. For instance, People with a certain type of psychological disorder enjoy eating plastic. Non-suicidal victims of another illness have a strong desire to hurt themselves physically, and so on. They often have good social adjustment, evidenced by such qualifiers as having earned college degrees. All these conditions are nevertheless psychological abnormalities as recognized by the scientific community. Many studies confirm that homosexuals have significantly higher rates of contracting AIDS committing suicide, and abusing drugs than the general population, even in countries such as Denmark, where same-sex marriages have long been legal and destigmatized. The prevalence of AIDS and syphilis among homosexuals is between 38 and 109 times that of the normal population. Before the breakthroughs in AIDS treatment made in the 1990s, the average lifespan of homosexuals was 8 to 20 years lower than the average population. These facts do not suggest that homosexuality is normal or healthy. As the LGBT movement continues to grow, the politically correct label of homophobia is used to attack those opposed to homosexuality, and experts who present findings that homosexuality is a mental illness are marginalized. A considerable number of homosexuals have obtained degrees in psychology and psychiatry and have become experts in, quote, queer studies. The supposedly scientific evidence widely quoted today to support homosexuality as, quote, normal behavior is the report of the Task Force on Appropriate Therapeutic Responses to Sexual Orientation, written by a working group appointed by the APA in 2009. Kinney has noted that out of the seven members of the working group, six, including the chairman, were homosexual or bisexual. The study cannot be considered scientifically neutral. Joseph Nicolosi, late president of the National Institute of Gay and Lesbian Studies, disclosed that at the time, the most qualified experts applied to join the working group, but because they belonged to the academic school that supported the use of treatment to correct homosexuality, none were accepted. Nicholas Cummings, a former APA president, said in a public statement that politics trumps science in the association, which has been taken over by advocates of homosexual rights. Today, the adjustment standard supported by queer studies experts and proponents of the homosexual movement is also widely used by the APA to measure other sexual psychological abnormalities, such as pedophilia. According to the APA, a pedophile is defined as an adult who feels intensely aroused or has sexual fantasies upon seeing a child, regardless of whether these impulses are acted upon or not. But as long as he or she is capable of demonstrating adjustment, then the pedophile's sexual orientation should be considered normal. Or rather, only when pedophiles feel shame, inner conflict, or other types of debilitating psychological pressure does it count as a disorder. This standard of diagnosis runs completely counter to normal human values. According to the APA, a person who feels shame and guilt for having unacceptable impulses is mentally ill, but someone who is comfortable with these impulses is supposedly healthy. 
homosexual marriage was legalized following this logic, and acceptance of pedophilia cannot be long in coming. David Thorstad, a Trotskyite and member of the American Communist Party, founded the North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMBLA. Another important figure in the American LGBT movement and a promoter of pedophilia is Allen Ginsberg, a communist and admirer of Fidel Castro. Aside from NAMBLA, another major pedophile organization is the Childhood Sensuality Circle, founded in California in 1971 by disciples of the German communist and pioneer of sexual liberation, Wilhelm Reich. Pandora's box has been thrown wide open. According to the adjustment standard of today's psychology, various perverted sexual freedoms advocated by the utopian socialist Charles Fourier, including incest, group marriage, and bestiality, can also be considered normal psychological states. The divine union of husband and wife has been distorted to include same-sex couples. It follows that incestuous families and marriage between humans and animals can be legalized. The devil is reducing man to a beast without standards or morals, so that he will be eventually destroyed. The LGBT movement, sex liberation, and feminism have put the family structure and human morality under total siege. It is a betrayal of the traditional marriage that God arranged for mankind. To treat homosexuals as fellow human beings is kind and good, but the devil has manipulated this kindness to deceive and destroy people who have forgotten that God's created men and women in their image and set the conditions for being human. When man is no longer man and woman is no longer woman, when people abandon divine moral codes and side with the devil for the sake of their desires, then there is no escape from the abyss of damnation. We may kind-heartedly say we respect your choice to those who have gone astray and wandered to the edge of the abyss, but this serves only to push them closer to danger. True compassion is to tell those who are misguided to distinguish between right and wrong, to lead them back to the upright path and help them avoid doom, even if it means being resented or misunderstood. D. Promoting Divorce and Abortion Before 1969, state divorce laws across the United States were based in traditional religious values. In order for a divorce to be considered, it required a legitimate claim of fault from one or both of the spouses. Western religion teaches that marriage was established by God. A stable family is beneficial to the husband, wife, children, and all of society. For this reason, the church and U.S. state laws all stressed the importance of preserving marriages except in extenuating circumstances. But in the 1960s, the ideology of the Frankfurt School had radiated out to society. Traditional marriage came under attack and the most damage was done by liberalism and feminism. Liberalism rejected the divine nature of marriage by reducing its definition to a social contract between two people, while feminism views the traditional family as a patriarchal instrument in the suppression of women. Divorce was promoted as a woman's liberation from the, quote, oppression of an unhappy marriage, or her path to a thrilling life of adventure. This mindset led to the legalization of no-fault divorce, allowing either spouse to disband a marriage as irreconcilable for any reason. The U.S. divorce rate grew rapidly in the 1970s. For the first time in American history, more marriages were being ended not by death, but by disagreement. Of all newlywed couples in the 1970s, nearly half would divorce. Divorce has deep and long-lasting effects on children. Michael Reagan, the adopted son of former President Ronald Reagan, described the separation of his parents. Quote, Divorce is where two adults take everything that matters to a child, the child's home, family, security, and sense of being loved and protected, and they smash it all up, leave it in ruins on the floor, then walk out and leave the child to clean up the mess. Promoting the, quote, right to abortion is another one of the methods the devil uses to destroy people. Initially, 
the discussion on legalized abortion was restricted to specific circumstances, such as rape, incest, or the debilitating health of the mother. Advocates of sexual liberation believe that sex should not be limited to the confines of marriage, but unwanted pregnancy presents a natural obstacle to this sort of lifestyle. Contraceptives may fail, so the promoters of unrestricted sex took up the cause of legalized abortion rights. At the 1994 United Nations International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, it was openly stipulated that, quote, reproductive rights are a natural human right, including the right to a, quote, satisfying and safe sex life, which covers abortion on demand. At the same time, feminists introduced, quote, my body, my rights, to argue that women have the right to give or to kill their unborn children. The debate expanded from allowing abortion in special circumstances to giving women the power to unilaterally end human life. While tempting people to give in to their desire, the devil uses feminism and sexual freedom to promote the massacre of the unborn. Not only have people been led to commit monstrous crimes, they have also abandoned the traditional understanding that life is sacred. E using the welfare system to encourage single-parent families. In 1965, just 5% of children were born to unmarried mothers. In that time, it was taken for granted that children grew up knowing their biological fathers. By the 2010s, however, unwed mothers accounted for 40% of births. From 1965 to 2012, the number of single-parent families in America shot from 3.3 million to 13 million. Though some fathers stayed through cohabitation or later marriage, the majority of children born to these single mothers grew up without their fathers. Fathers serve as role models to their sons by teaching them how to be men and show their daughters what it feels like to be respected in the way women deserve. Children suffer greatly from the absence of a father. Research shows that children who grew up without fathers often suffer from low self-esteem. They are likely to skip classes and drop out of school at a rate as high as 71%. Many do drugs, join gangs, and commit crimes. 85% of jailed youths and 90% of the homeless population were raised in fatherless households. Early sexual experience, teen pregnancy, and promiscuity are common. People who grew up without their fathers are 40 times more likely to commit sex offenses compared with the rest of the population. The Brookings Institute offered three key pieces of advice for young people looking to escape poverty. Graduate from high school, get a full-time job, and wait until age 21 to marry and have children. Statistically speaking, only 2% of Americans who meet these conditions live in poverty, and 75% are considered middle class. In other words, completing education, finding employment, Marrying at a suitable age and having children in the confines of marriage is the most reliable way to become a responsible adult living a healthy, productive life. Most single mothers rely on government charity. A report published by the Heritage Foundation used detailed statistical data to show that the welfare policy so strongly advocated by feminists actually encourages the creation of single mother households, even to the point of penalizing couples from marrying since they would receive fewer benefits. The government has effectively replaced the father with welfare. Welfare policies have not helped families living in poverty. Instead, they have simply supported the ever-increasing number of single-parent families, with the children of such households themselves prone to poverty. The result is a vicious cycle of expanding reliance on state aid. This is exactly what the specter of communism aims to achieve control over every aspect of the individual's life through high taxation and omnipresent government. F. Promoting Degenerate Culture The Wall Street Journal published a report quoting the U.S. Census Bureau, finding that in the year 2000, 55% of people between the ages of 25 and 34 were married, and 34% had never been married. By 2015, these figures had changed to 40% and 53% respectively. 
Young people in the United States are avoiding marriage because in today's culture, sex and marriage are completely separated. What do they need to get married for? In this degenerate environment, the trend is toward casual, no-strings-attached hookups. Sex has nothing to do with affection, not to mention commitment and responsibility. Even more frightening is the profusion of myriad sexual orientations. Facebook's user profile options provide 60 different types of sexual orientations. If young people can't even tell if they are male or female, how will they view marriage? The evil specter has used the law and society to completely rework these God-given concepts. Homosexuality and other degenerate sexual behavior was originally referred to as sodomy in English. Sodomy is a biblical reference to the city of Sodom, wiped out in God's wrath for people's practice of sexual degeneracy. The word sodomy serves as a warning to humankind that disastrous consequences will occur if people stray from divine principles. The gay rights movement worked very hard to appropriate the term gay, a word with an originally positive meaning, and lead people to further sin. Adultery used to be a negative term referring to immoral sexual habits. Today, it has been watered down to, quote, extramarital sexual relations or cohabitation. In The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hester Prynne committed adultery and struggled to remake herself through repentance. But in today's society, repentance is not necessary. Adulterers can enjoy life holding their heads high and proud. Chastity used to be a virtue in both Eastern and Western cultures. Today it is an anachronistic joke. Passing judgment on homosexuality and sexual morality is forbidden in the dictatorship of political correctness. The only acceptable stance is to respect others' quote, free choice. This is not only true in everyday life, but throughout academia, where morality is divorced from practical reality. Deviated and degenerated things have been normalized. Those who indulge in their desires feel no pressure or guilt. The devil's plot for humanity's damnation is well underway. Western people under the age of 50 can barely remember the culture that used to exist in society. At that time, almost all children grew up with the presence of their biological fathers. Gay meant happy. White wedding gowns represented chastity. Pornographic content was banned from TV and radio. But that was undone in just 60 years, as the devil completely overturned the traditional way of life. 6. How the Chinese Communist Party Destroys Families A. Breaking up families in the name of equality Mao Zedong's slogan, Women Hold Up Half the Sky, has now made its way into the West as a trendy feminist catchphrase. The ideology that men and women are the same, promoted under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, is essentially no different from Western feminism. In the West, gender discrimination is used as a weapon to maintain a state of political correctness. In China, though it differs in practice, the label male chauvinism is used to similar destructive effect. The gender equality advocated by Western feminism demands equality of outcome between men and women through measures such as gender quotas, financial compensation, and lowered standards. Under the CCP's slogan that women hold up half the sky, women are expected to show the same ability in the same work that is done by their male counterparts. Those who attempted to perform tasks for which they were hardly qualified were lauded as heroines and awarded titles such as the holder of the March 8th Red Banner. Propaganda posters in the 1960s or 70s typically portrayed women as physically robust and powerful, while Mao Zedong enthusiastically called on women to turn their love for makeup to military uniforms. Mining, lumbering, steelmaking, fighting in the battlefield, every type of job or role was opened up to them. In an article published on October 1, 1966, the People's Daily carried a story titled, quote, Girls Can Slaughter Pigs, Too. It described an 18-year-old girl who became a local celebrity working as a slaughterhouse apprentice, where studying Mao Zedong thought helped her to work up the courage to slaughter pigs. She said, quote, If you can't even kill a pig, how can you expect to kill the enemy? 
Although Chinese women, quote, hold up half the sky, feminists in the West still find China's gender equality lacking in many areas. The CCP's Politburo Standing Committee, for example, never has any female members for fear that this would encourage a social movement for more political rights, such as democracy, which would pose a threat to the party's totalitarian rule. Out of similar concerns, the party also refrained from publicly supporting homosexuality, instead taking a neutral stance on the issue. However, seeing it as a convenient tool in the destruction of humankind, the party encouraged homosexuality to grow in China by using the influence of media and popular culture. Since 2001, the Chinese Society of Psychiatry no longer lists homosexuality as a mental disorder. The media also quietly substituted the word gay with comrade, a term with more positive connotations. In 2009, the CCP approved the first Chinese LGBT event, Shanghai Pride Week. The approaches may vary, but everywhere the devil pursues the same goal to abolish the traditional ideal of a good wife and loving mother, to force women to abandon their gentle character, and to destroy the harmony between men and women that is needed to create a balanced family and bring up well-adjusted children. B. Using political struggle to turn husbands and wives against each other. Traditional Chinese values are based on family morality. The devil knows that the most effective way to undermine traditional values is to start from sabotaging human relations. In the continuous political struggle started by the CCP, family members reported each other to the authorities in a mad competition for a better political status. By betraying those closest to them, they could demonstrate a firmer, more loyal stance in favor of party orthodoxy. In December 1966, Mao's secretary, Hu Xiaomu, was dragged to the Beijing Iron and Steel Institute, where his own daughter took to the stage and shouted, quote, Smash Hu Xiaomu's dog head. Although she did not actually smash her father's head, there were others who did just that. At the time, there was a, quote, capitalist family in the Dongsi subdistrict of Beijing. Guards beat the old couple nearly to death and forced their middle school aged son to beat them. He used dumbbells to smash his father's head and went insane afterward. Often, those condemned by the party as, quote, class enemies would disown their families so as to spare them from implication. Even class enemies who committed suicide would first have to break off family ties, lest the CCP hound their family members after their suicide. For example, when the literary theorist Ye Yi Chun was persecuted and driven to suicide in the Cultural Revolution, his parting letter read, quote, Going forward, the only thing that is required of you is to resolutely listen to the party's words stand firm on the party's position, gradually recognize my sins, stir up hatred against me, and unwaveringly break off our familial ties. The persecution against the Falun Gong spiritual practice, which has continued since 1999, is the largest political movement launched by the CCP in the modern era. A common strategy the authorities use against Falun Gong practitioners is to coerce their family members to aid in the persecution. The CCP imposes administrative harassment, financial penalties, and other forms of intimidation upon family members to get them to use any means to pressure practitioners into giving up their faith. The CCP blames the victims of persecution for practicing Falun Gong, telling them that their families are being implicated because they refuse to compromise. Many Falun Gong practitioners have been divorced or disowned by their loved ones due to this form of persecution. Given the large number of people practicing Falun Gong, countless families have been torn apart by the party's campaign. C. Using forced abortion for population control Shortly after Western feminists succeeded in the battle to legalize abortion, women in the People's Republic of China had abortion imposed upon them by the CCP's family planning policies. The mass killing of the unborn has resulted in a humanitarian and social disaster of untold scale. The CCP follows Marxist materialism and believes that childbirth is a form of productive action no different from steelmaking or agriculture. 
It thus follows that the philosophy of economic planning be extended to the family. Mao Zedong said, quote, Mankind must control itself and implement planned growth. It may sometimes increase a bit, and it may come to a halt at times. In the 1980s, the Chinese regime began to implement the one-child policy with extreme and brutal measures, as exhibited by slogans unfurled across the country, quote, If one person violates the law, the whole village will be sterilized. Quote, Earth the first, tire tubes after the second, scrape out the third and fourth. A variation of the slogan was simply, quote, Kill, kill, kill the third and fourth. Quote, we would rather see a stream of blood than a birth too many. Quote, Ten or more graves is better than one extra life. Such bloodthirsty lines are ubiquitous throughout China. The Family Planning Commission uses heavy fines, plunder, demolition, assault, detention, and other such punishment to deal with violations of the one child's policy. In some places, Family planning officials drowned babies by throwing them into paddy fields. Heavily pregnant women were not exempt. Even with childbirth just days away, they were forced to have abortions. According to incomplete statistics published in the China Health Yearbook, the total number of abortions in China between 1971 and 2012 was at least 270 million. That is, over a quarter of a billion unborn children were killed by the CCP over this period. One of the most serious consequences of the one-child policy is the disproportionate number of female infants aborted or abandoned, leading to a serious imbalance in the sex ratio of Chinese under the age of 30. Due to the shortage of girls, it is estimated that by 2020 there will be some 40 million young men who cannot marry a woman of childbearing age. China's man-made sex imbalance has triggered serious social problems, such as an increase in sexual abuse and prostitution, commercialized marriage, and trafficking of women. 7. The Consequences of Communism's Assault on the Family Marx and other communists advocated the abolition of the family by pointing out and exaggerating the existence of phenomena such as adultery, prostitution, and illegitimate children despite the fact that the communists themselves were also guilty of these things. The gradual degeneration of morality that occurred in the Victorian era eroded the sacred institution of marriage and brought people further from divine teachings. The communists urged women to violate their marital oaths for the sake of their supposed personal happiness. But the result was the opposite, like drinking seawater as a remedy for thirst. The communist specter's, quote, solution for oppression and inequality amounts to nothing more than dragging down the standards of human morality to hellish depths. It made behavior once universally condemned as ugly and unforgivable into the new norm. In the, quote, equality of communism, all are marching to the same fate of destruction. The communist specter created the mistaken belief that sin is not caused by the degeneration of morality but by social oppression. It led people to find a way out by turning their backs on tradition and moving away from God. It used the beautiful rhetoric of freedom and liberation to advocate feminism, homosexuality, and sexual perversion. Women have been stripped of their dignity, men have been robbed of their responsibility, and the sanctity of family has been trampled upon, turning the children of today.